Resolution is always a compromise we have got used to. Why not talk about it again? This is why the next talk is entitled Institution for Resolution Disputes. And uh, our uh, speaker is Rosa Menkman, a Dutch artist, curator and researcher and founder of IRD or the Institute of Resolution Dispute. A big applause for... Uh, Rosa, please, <laughs> and the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here on this like very late part of the whole conference. And I've, I mean, when I was checking in, everybody seemed so tired. It was really funny to experience this like latency in everybody. So uh, I'm Rosa Menkman. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, everybody speaks German to me here. It's really funny because my name sounds German, but uh, actually when you say something in German, I will speak back in English. But please speak to me when you want to. Um, in 2015, I'm going to talk from 2015 onwards, uh, I was invited to be a research fellow in a big institute in the Netherlands to do uh, research on resolutions. And this was a huge honor for me, and I dropped everything in London, where I used to live at the time, and uh, went and moved back to Amsterdam, which actually was not my favorite city in the world at all. So I went there, and three days before my, um, my contract started, which we had already signed like a month back and everything, I was fired. Because the head of the department had looked into my accreditation and my PhD that I was doing at the time had started somewhere else and had not the right accreditations since I ported it from Cologne to London. And so I would have to revisit the whole institutional network and get my stuff right in time to start. Now, that was not possible. And so I was, how do you say that properly for a live stream? I was like, drop the kitty dad. Um, so, I got really, how you say, like sad in Amsterdam, alone, without a cause, and kind of angry with institutions. And this is when, at a certain time, I got out of my um, darkness and went to the Californian desert to live alone in the middle of nowhere. And this talk will be about two works that I made, or two institutions, um, two exhibitions, one is the institutions, institutes, like a uh, double, uh, or a plural, uh, for resolution disputes, and then the second one, which is kind of a more in-depth research, is Behind White Shadows. And I made these, and the research kind of started in um, the desert, where I was looking from my house into this little village. You have to imagine the desert, there's not a lot, but straight from my patio, I could see this. This is from Google Street for you, so you can't really see it very well, but this is Little Baghdad. And Little Baghdad is a military place where people bomb the hell out of at night. So you wake up, you hear and feel all this infrasound, then you know the military is having some fun or something like that. Not from, yeah. So um, I was inspired by uh, a research that was done in the zone by Trevor Peglin. Trevor Peglin, you all should know, is a hacker and uh, artist and uh, yeah, political artist and technologist. And he made a work called Symbology. That's a research on all the military patches in the USA. He went to Area 51, drove around it, and in, interviewed people to see what all those patches meant. And he found out there is a secret language in these patches. And so while I was there and I could see and hear and feel all these secret military operations, I still had no idea what was happening. So I was really inspired by like, not really understanding all the data, all the information, all the feelings you have while you're sitting on your patio. And this, with the symbology research, made me to create these two patches, which are kind of like the keys to two works, the institution, Institutions for Resolution Disputes, and uh, behind the white shadows. One is the black on black patch, which is an encrypted patch. And the second one is a white on white patch and it glows in the dark because I like that. Um, with this started also because 
you know, the um, institute had dropped me, but I still wanted to do my research. I started to do it by myself, and I started to call it Beyond Resolution, mostly because I was dropped from the school, but also because, you know, I wanted to understand what was happening between these things that I can sense, but that are not resolved for me to be read. So I started this Beyond Resolution is the website, and I research resolutions from a vernacular, a habitual, genealogical, a tactical, and a skill perspective. So I think these are five very interesting ways to break resolutions down, and to understand that resolutions are not always ways to solve an image, a text, whatever, but also a way to compromise certain data and to not be able to understand it, to make things unintelligible or to obfuscate or even cut out particular pieces of information. So this was not the first time I had a fight with an institutional network. Um, when I was young already, I was really inspired by, you know, like all kids actually, I was inspired by the universe, uh, uh, specifically sound in space. And I wanted to research sound in space, but my teacher told me it's not possible because there is no sound in space. Only years later, I found out that there is actually sound in space. You need to just transcode it in the right way. You can transcode specific frequencies. And that's when I started to understand there's much more to data than just the ways we normally show it. So I started in my classes to explain to my kids. I've been teaching this year two colloquia here in Germany and also some in other countries, just uh, visiting lectureships there. I was starting to teach about the rheology of data. The rheology is a term from um, uh, physics, and it means kind of the fluidity of matter and the siphoning of data. So here you see, you know, um, just a normal uh, spectrum that you can listen to, but you also see a little rainbow, very simplified rainbow. And I teach my kids in one of the first classes that you can actually listen to rainbows if you just sonify them. And what that means, because there's a whole political field here uh, in medicine and in um, big data research, sometimes sono sono sonifying certain pieces of data gives us a completely new insight. Um, this year I had to teach a class of painters, and they don't do computation at all. They're actually scared of it. One of the kids told me, yeah, but you know, you make art or you make artistic work with your computation. How do you find emotions in that? How can you, I mean, it's not possible. Computers are without, and I was just like, where is actually the emotion in paint? You know, you put it in there. So I have all these like very basic problems that I encounter when I teach these kids about very complex ways of thinking about your data, or complex, or maybe so not complex that it becomes complex for them, like taking away all the institutional frameworks and really going to the core, and how can you translate them? So this is a work by Bflix, and I tried to use it as an example of how data and painting can come together. This is a string of data that he painted on a, a piece of fabric, but then he gives you the program that can be any object, and you can wrap it around the object, and then it becomes a painting, depending on the program that you know shows the, that piece of data. I think it's a very interesting way to connect the materiality of paint and the materiality of data and to kind of bridge the gap. And I'm kind of explaining these things also because I think all of us are educators in a certain way, specifically if you're a hacker, you're dealing a lot with opening up information and trying to make it like understandable for other people. Um, or yeah, obfuscate it, but then you have to understand how other people um, read it. So what I'm trying to do is also give you some problems that I've been running into while I've been teaching this whole year like crazy to make some side money since I have no more money. Now you've been thinking probably like what is this crazy presentation she's giving with the clouds and the weird sh slides. It's part of um, a work that I've made um, a few, uh, wait I have to go to here, yeah. It's a 3D work. It was inspired by work that was called Compressed Process. It was a way to get my videos out of the quadrilateral frame because one way that resolutions make us think about our media is the way they are embedded. So if I put my video, for instance, on Vimeo, I know it's a work of video that I can probably skip through. If I want to make a piece of video art and I want to really think about the materiality of that piece of video art and then put it on Vimeo, 
I kind of defeat this purpose, right? It becomes this like really boring object that, I mean, if I watch video art online, which I rarely do, but if I do it, I skip every 15 seconds or maybe minutes. I mean, if I look through my own videos on Vimeo, then I have hardly any full plays. So I started to feel really like this is defeating the purpose of my research. So I was starting to make applications to put videos in, to make weird slideshow things. And this is uh, a work that I released, and I released it and got a Wired review, Wired Germany, thank you very much. And they said, it's a flop. As a video game, it's super annoying. Now, I was just making a piece of video art in a 3D environment, but what I realized is that you can never escape your resolution. Video is what is in a flat screen. The moment I put my videos in 3D as a texture that you can navigate, it becomes a video game, even if there's no goal but just to watch some silly stuff float around. So you can never escape your resolutions. Every time you're deconstructing a resolution, you're also reconstructing a new resolution. So you're always building compromises and debuilding compromises. So um, that said, I was really annoyed with the institute that fired me, and I started um, the Institutions for Resolution Disputes. And this was really to show them, like, look, I want to win from you, basically. I don't know how to say this properly. Um, I will skip a few slides because I'm going through time very fast. This is um, a resolution target. I'm using this slide because uh, this is actually a, an, an aerial photography target from 1951 for analog photography. It was used also in the Californian desert by the American um, uh, military. I was living two hours drive away from this, so one day I drove through the desert in my uh, little car and almost got stuck, but I survived. And I saw it and uh, realized later that there's a work by Hito Stilo inspired by this pattern, and it's beautiful and all about resolutions. And in this work she is saying, this is a resolution target. It measures the resolution of the world as a picture. Resolution determines visibility. Whatever is not captured, um, by resolution is invisible. And what I'm trying to do is expand the visibility and make things visible that are normally not visible. Um, I'm gonna skip a few slides and uh, go to a work that I made when I was finally coming back from the desert and invited by Transfer Gallery in New York to make a solo show about my <laughs> anger. Um, at, at that time, I was actually um, uh, a approached by the Museum of Modern Art in Amsterdam to buy a big work of mine, the vernacular file formats. It's a work that kind of um, deconstructs different kinds of compression languages and shows what is the basis and the politics of these compressions. So I used the same image. I put a similar glitch in it or similar data obstruction and see what comes out and by this, by these aesthetics that come out on the surface, I try to explain how these compressions are built. When the museum wanted to buy it, they wanted to buy the research archive, which means uh, 16 gigabytes of broken data, basically, all put into folders of like, this is a JPEG when it's broken like this. So what do you do when you um, sell 16 gigabytes of broken data and how do you show it? I started to research what else was happening in this um, work, I'm going to boot up a new presentation because uh, unfortunately, poof, yeah. I started to realize that my work actually has lived beyond this particular research. Um, this is also my face, but I started to see it in many places. I started to see it on teacups, I started to see it on sweaters, a lot of uh, glitch iPhone and um, Android apps use it as their icon. I started to see that people used my face and clicked on it and then they were making a glitch. So this work expanded from its research archive and uh, the PDF that was constructed out of it to something com completely copied without copyright, um, commodified and strange for me. I lost my own face in a way. And then I started to realize that this is not, I'm not the only one that has lost their face. So um, I did 
uh, a little bit of research and found, for instance, this work by James Bridle, who's been doing research on the render ghosts. If you're walking through London and you see all these billboards of new architectural constructions being built, then you always have these render ghosts put inside of them. And um, he made a whole archive of trying to understand who these people are. This is his uh, render research uh, blog, uh, in which he has a whole archive of different kinds of people. And when he finally researched where these people came from, he came to an, um, kind of a company that sells render bots or render images uh, that were based in um, New Mexico. And so he went to New Mexico to see if he could find these people and to ask, did anybody ask you if they could use your face? But he found nobody that looked like these people, of course. Of course, because, you know. Um, finally, he found somebody in a bar that told them, like, look, if you really look close to these people, they really don't look like people in New Mexico. These are fancy people, and most of them are maybe Asian, but definitely not very much looking like the people that walk the streets of New Mexico. And finally, he never got the answer, but he did realize that these people were probably never asked to be used. So this is one example of the line in which I've seen this kind of co-optation of or objectification of humans. Um, this is a research by uh, Constant Dullard. He presented it in the 32nd uh, C3. Uh, it's called um, Jennifer in Paradise. It's part of um, a possibility of an army talk. If you ever want to look it back, it's a beautiful talk. Here, Constant found the photo of Jennifer. Jennifer was the soon-to-be wife of John Knoll, the programmer of Photoshop. And John tried to test his Photoshop software on an image. And that image was the image of his not so very properly dressed girlfriend, Jennifer, at the time. And um, one of the lines that I think are most striking of this work is when he says, did you ever ask permission to Jennifer? Do you realize that you're uh, objectifying your own soon-to-be wife? Um, it's an open letter to Jennifer, but um, there are some remarks in another article on, uh, in which he says these things. Um, so I realized I'm in this tradition, but worse even, Switching again because there's not, I cannot port a lot of slides in my strangely built software. I'm uh, part of a, a more longer tradition or a longer tradition of Caucasian test cards. While I was using my face as a test card for a glitch, so how do images fall apart, there's actually a long tradition of the use of the white face or the white model in photography and other image processing technologies. So here are some normal test images. These are very pretty ladies. Um, here is uh, an image of Teddy. Um, her name is Teddy Smith. She was the Playboy centerfold of the 1960s. And she was used for a paper on dither. Um, here is uh, Lena Jpeg. Lena was the Playboy centerfold of 1973. And um, when in 1972, and when in 1973, Nasir Ahmed, um, a researcher originally from Bangalore, tried to write about a new compression standard using DCT, discrete cosine transform, which became later the basis of JPEG. Um, he was not really met with a lot of enthusiasm. However, when he finally did publish his paper on DCT, um, California picked up really fast. And um, in one of the labs, um, a few guys um, found an image to test his premise of DCTs. And this was Lena. And Lena was the basis of the compressions that we still use most often in our... And if you walk through, for instance, the kebab or whatever, and you see these big photos of kebabs on, on the front of the... If, for instance, if you go to Son Ale, you'll see a kebab printed out really big. And you see these, like, kind of blocky kebab parts. That is a block that has been tested on Lena, but only tested on Lena. So the people... Uh, in this particular research place, they were using an image of the 1972 centerfold, scanned it in with their own Moorhead scanner. They had um, a self-built circuit bent 
a mirror head scanner with three channels, a red, green, and blue, but one of the channels or one of the, uh, the, the scanning uh, mechanisms was a little bit slower, so they lost one line. She got a little bit thinner even in the photo, so she looked a little bit better. Um, and they used only this photo. It's 512 by 512 pixels. So from a media archaeological perspective, this is a very strange object, but also, if you think about politics, they use just this image as a one-size-fits-all. But compression in our daily lives is not one-size-fits-all. It's not physics is just physics. We're using different objects to compress our images with. So what would it mean if we now use still the Lena compression when it's just another kind of image? Is there maybe a racist undertone in this kind of compression? Uh, there was a lot of research and a lot of like um, kind of uh, like uh, not anger but like criticism from f mostly the female community. Um, finally, um, this is not the end of the Caucasian test card. We still have this kind of usage of white images in all our technologies. For instance, um, in uh, the H the HP HP um, webcams in um, a few years ago. Uh, they were only tested on white people, and once they went to sale, to retail, they would not track any black images and any black facials because um, they were never tested on this. There was also the Nikon Coolpix camera that always would ask Asian features, are you maybe closing your eyes? So they were never tested on any but Caucasian faces. So this whole history of using a Caucasian test object is still apparent in everyday technologies, and it's really problematic. And I realized that I kind of unknowingly kind of was playing a role in this by also using my own face and letting this be the face for deconstructing facial um, or uh, vernacular file formats, the compression of images. So by behind the white shadows, I showed my research archive. I also showed the research archive of other image, um, uh, images that used white Caucasian females. And I finally showed the work um, that I made for, um, for the whole... Um, I said, when I do a lot of research on compressions, I've, I realize that um, when I try to explain it, often um, when I really go into the mathematics, I lose my students completely. So I was starting to try to build kind of works that would not just be mathematical, but try to get the emotions that the painters wanted in my um, work back. And so I started to kind of anthropomorphize my, um, my objects. So for instance, JPEGs are built out of blocks. I started to really make works in which the blocks were talking about their experience of compressing um, a particular image. Um, one of the works was DCT siphoning. I will play it in the background really quickly, if it wants to. Yeah, there it is. So, oh, it doesn't really want to play, but that doesn't, oh, it's because it's also playing on my own screen. Anyway, in DCT siphoning, uh, there is two blocks. It's inspired by uh, the Roman flatland by James Abbott. And um, in flatland, um, there's, um, an object in a flatland that has to learn about different uh, complexities of space, Euclidean space. In this uh, particular uh, inspiration, I'm taking two blocks that have to learn about different complexities of compression. So they go from the dots, the pixels, to the lines, which are, for instance, the basis of GIFs, to the blocks, their own space for JPEGs, to wavelets and to vector objects or even LIDAR uh, technologies. And um, they experience it how humans would experience it. The sun gets, or the little one sometimes gets really scared, while the big one kind of knows what to expect and tries to hold him by the hand and tries to explain, like, look, you don't have to be scared here, it's just lines, it's just vectors, etc. So it's kind of like how humans experience things that they cannot read, that are illeg illegible to them and how when we um, see something that we cannot understand often, just dismiss it and don't want to read it. 
And I find this um, really important, and I think also um, just to uh, to try to um, explain that when you dismiss stuff, you're dismissing actually a piece of information that might be really important and that might be legible. I cannot just show the, the kids that I'm teaching, like, look, there is something, you just don't understand it. So what I'm trying to do is build these works to show how they are acting towards um, their compressions and their digital technologies and explain them, like, look, you're acting just like this little block that runs away from the compression. So, um, what I wanted to uh, close with uh, is the conclusion of the two exhibitions, the Institutions for Resolution Disputes and Behind White Shadows. And um, that's the question, every time we're using technologies, they're following particular resolutions, resolution sets through standards, for instance, by the ISO or uh, other um, standardizing institutions. Um, we have to always ask, ask who set these standards, who made these resolutions, and what are they compromising? Because if we're not asking what are they compromising, we might become blind to other options. For instance, video is not just a quadrilateral object, right? If video would be something more than just what's happening within this quadrilateral frame, this window, then I would have different, I could make different shapes of video, I could put them on top of each other, I could make a collage of videos that would have different timelines and different soundtracks, and I could really play with what video also is, because in the end, video is just a moving story that can have different levels. But because of computer technologies and other technologies before it, we've become stuck in the resolution of video and we've compromised the other options. And these compromises are not just in fun, they are in actual real life uh, realities that give problems to us or that make problems for other people. And that's why we need to ask what is always, who is setting the affordances of our resolutions and what is being um, compromised who is casting the shadows behind our technologies? Um, and so I wanted to close with a quote by Hannah Arendt, which is, um, define and create the future. Do not be defined just by your past. And I think we should also use our technologies these ways. We can still define and create our futures. We can create our own power points in weird 3D technologies. And we can um, make videos that are not quadrilateral and then get burned by like wired reviews or whatever. That's okay. You know, it's actually fun to get an angry review because people are just really boring. Um, so the work, this deciphering, is downloadable from my uh, website, the paper behind white shadows also, and. Um, I would like to end here and maybe take a question, if there is a question. Thank you. We have about two minutes for questions. Uh, there are four microphones, two on this side, two on this side. Um, and uh, yeah, microphone two, please ask a question. Hello. Uh, uh, thanks for your great talk. It's great to see uh, concepts like discrete coastal transformations and uh, run length encoding being uh, present in artwork. Um, uh, also, I found out uh, many years ago that uh, in the JPEG standard, there's an optional uh, way of compressing uh, uh, JPEGs. Uh, instead of Huffman encoding, you can use rhythmic coding, and it's never enabled by any browser. So those JPEGs are never used, but they should be more, much smaller and uh, use more, uh, less bandwidth. Uh, have you seen any people that actually would like to introduce uh, arithmetic coding or other compression standards or variants of it uh, uh, just to, uh, well, uh, uh, use more computing power and uh, save bandwidth? I think <laughs> one of my uh, favorite artists working with JPEG is um, Ted Davis. He's based out of Basel and he's been doing really, um, breaking the JPEG compression down really from like, the basics, and then you can really write into the JPEG compression. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he tackled even arithmetic uh, encoding. Oh. Yeah, um, actually, I did. I didn't show this, but um, in the end, I wanted to, and I will show it to you because 
you're asking about JPEGs. This is um, a work that I made when I was actually fired by the Institute. And it uses the DCTs. Um, when I was fired, they, um, they made a cryptography um, design award. And I thought, now you fired me, I will make a game with you. I will send you some cryptography. So I made my own kind of like encryption, which is, of course, I mean, even cryptography design seems like really silly. So I thought, OK, I will do something really silly. I used the DCT that you're asking about. Uh, DCT is a discrete cosine transform. It consists, consists of 64 macro blocks. Um, I mapped every macro block to every glyph of the alphabet, so the 64 most used characters. And then I wrote them a message, a really angry message. Actually, one of the institutions uh, is completely against them. It's one of the five institutions of the exhibition. And guess who won that competition? I don't think they ever read it because they're too lame to read the shit, but I think they did something nice back. Nice means that I got one-tenth of the money they were supposed to pay me in this silly computer here, but I feel like in a way I fucked up. I said it anyway. Um, so I, I, I won a little bit that day, but just uh, one-tenth of what I lost. <laughs> Thank you. Is there another question from the internet uh, signal agent? No? Then uh, I, I would like to have the opportunity to ask uh, a question myself, because I did uh, work in super resolution microscopy. Did you ever look into uh, super resolving biological structures? I've seen some Moye patterns in your work, in your presentation right now. Did you ever touch that, or what did you do with Moye patterns? Moiré patterns? Yes. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay, so for me, um, I was talking a little bit about an ecology of compression complexities. So really going from the line to the dots, to the lines, to the blocks, to the wavelets, to the, you know, like really complex. I would say also zip files are part of that complexity, yeah. like when yes. everything just gets chaotic, when we as humans don't have a Euclidean space necessarily to compare to it, then it becomes really messy. But anyway, the, um, they go through a, a, a line environment. And in this line environment, uh, the little one gets really excited because he can play through the moray patterns. And actually, he's having a little uh, romantic moment with one of the moray's, which is also a mm. joke because, you know, a lot of people only like to like things they understand already. They I mean, the exercise is always in understanding something that is more complex, but that's what most people are scared of. So it's easy to fall in love with a line if you're a block. It's hard to fall in love with a wavelet, right? So, I mean, but anyway, that's not really your question. You're asking about um, Moiré in biology, and I've never worked with Moiré in biology. <laughs> Was that a... An yeah, answer? yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, any question left? I think we are out of time. Yes, a big hand, a round of applause for our speaker, Rosa Menkeman.